Sadia Psychology? Sadia, Psych- Sadia Khan, but yes, Sadia Psychology Online. What I disagreed with in Pakistani culture is they labelled it as, as is what will people say. There's so much weirdness now in the dating. Yeah. We didn't, ha- we don't have our moms to kind of prepare us because they didn't date. The demise of the arranged marriage is something that now, as I can look back, I actually think it's a really good thing, and I know really? that sounds bizarre. Do you think we look for chemistry and connection because that's kind of something that we never saw growing up? I never cheat on my partner. Everybody has a potential. And I really learned that because sometimes I'm dealing with clients and it's people who genuinely can't believe they're into this behavior. Testing, one, two, three. You're tuned in to Up and Coming, the pod where we discuss everything that is up and coming with your girl, Kiran Fatima. Okay, guys, so we're back in Dubai. I'm super excited for today's episode because we have Sadia. Sadia Psychology? Sadia Sadia Khan, but yes, Sadia Psychology Online. (laughs) Okay, so I came across your videos a couple years ago, found out you... Are you you sure it was me? I only started in end of 2021. So then maybe two years ago makes a couple. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, Yeah. around that time. And um, when I moved here, I found out you live here as well. Yeah. Mm. Super excited Mm because there was a brown girl that's not only... Beautiful, firstly. Thank you. Super intelligent is what you come across as well. And I know you are now that I've been talking to you for a while and following your videos. Yeah. And then, like I said, same ethnicity. Yes, I and love that. Your vibe to me was kind of like, it kind of felt like you're talking for the girls, like a cousin or someone like telling you like, girls, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Or even right. boys. Even boys, yeah. So I want to start with, how did you get into this? Like, um, I, I think I've mentioned it. I, what happens is I was always a psychology teacher okay. for many, many years. And um, my mom would always kind of see something a little bit bigger than just being a teacher. She always wanted me to do something uh, a little bit more out there. She was always like, oh, please, you're good at public speaking. Do something mm-hmm. in public. And I was very lazy with it. And then she just kept encouraging me until she actually kind of went out and bought, she actually flew to Dubai to force me to do it. Stop. And then she bought the tripod and she bought everything and she just said just do one video I don't care if it's good or bad just try it see how it goes and um, I tried it and because I did something I think I did something on TikTok and this is when okay. TikTok was you know you can become quick, big quite quick Yeah. so um, it went a little bit big on TikTok quite quickly and uh, so then I ended up leaving teaching and then pursuing more psychology and per- permanently. That's so interesting yeah. because that, like your mom especially being your number one support I see mm. a lot of influencers and in- girls in general who are like, our parents were kind of against it. Yeah, I think what it is, my dad doesn't know what social media is. Yeah. Uh, like all helps. of so, yeah, like, <laughs> He doesn't know what Instagram, he doesn't know what, he definitely doesn't know what TikTok is. He knows what Facebook is. And because uh-huh. I'm not on face- <laughs> these things, because my dad doesn't know what it is, we got away with it. We've been getting away with mm-hmm. it. I'm, I'm sure now he knows <laughs> what's going on. Uh, but we, it's because it's not so in the, out there for him. And as long as dad is okay with it, then we're allowed to do it. That's kind of the rules in the house and uh, the other rules is as long as you're dressed modestly and you don't talk about anything that's immodest and goes against your faith you're allowed and, that, yeah. and which I was really surprised about I thought just your face out there my parents would be angry I know. but she I think she just saw potential in me and she thought it would be a waste to keep she, if I was just post- posting pictures of me in clothes never would that be allowed if it was just me out in restaurants and having an open profile never would that be allowed but because it's educational she's very encouraging my dad I don't think he knows what a podcast is no that, <laughs> <laughs> my dad doesn't know he what a doesn't podcast is. doesn't know what it is I think he thinks it's something yeah. you put in coffees or something yeah. I don't think he knows what a podcast is so, oh God, so I've never like, asked him or if he's seen anything I've never said anything so, isn't that so funny that is. I say it to my mum and all my family even like my dad's side of the family will message me and be like oh we saw you here we saw yeah. you there but my dad and I just don't talk about it wait that's so interesting that they haven't even forwarded it like here's your daughter which- I'm sure he's got it <laughs> yeah and my dad <laughs> Being my dad would never sit through a podcast for an hour, even if it was me or anything like that. So I think he's just probably just does a scan to make sure I'm not too close to a boy and making yeah. sure that I'm not wearing anything wrong. And then that's it. Halas, yeah. watch the rest. That's it. No, that he does a sense. security check. Yeah, I know. Yeah. My dad's like, I don't even. Is this this is another phase you're going? Yeah, through. he just like, thinks yeah. it's a joke. It's, it's a he, he thinks it's funny. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> I'm so excited because a lot of my friends know you. Ah. We all follow you. We that's all follow cute. your advice. First, stop. <laughs> We do. And they sent me so many questions. Oh, but cool. the first one, I'm going to be selfish. I'm going to ask my own mm. toxic brown. You know what? I hate the word toxic, by the way, but yeah. like brown culture because yeah. we're both brown. Yes. And I love that because therapy is a big thing with my friends in America. Uh-huh. 
they can't even find a licensed professional mm -hmm. of the same color to talk yeah, about it's certain really hard when you yeah talk, about like yeah. even parental issues that maybe they grew up with which mm. kind of translated now into their personalities yeah what are you seeing because i'm sure you have so much experience yeah a common pattern with like brown girls or boys i think what happens is firstly they can't find a therapist that gets it a therapist will say well as long as you're happy it doesn't matter and tell your parents that you want to move out and it's like exactly. well, you can't, you're, you can't. You're, you're not allowed they don't understand that you're literally not allowed to in do respect, that it's like a big thing in our yeah. culture and yeah. religion and our parents matter yeah, we can't just we can't just you know disappear so i think that lack of cultural understanding is leaving people with unresolved traumas and issues but the actual um dynamics of a ethnic background in a western culture or even in where you where where you grew up um it does leave us a bit prone to trauma I, because the thing is the love is very conditional it is it's very and we are told constantly by all the research children are supposed to just exist and you get love they're not supposed to be pretty they're not supposed to be intelligent they're not supposed to be uh, obedient they're supposed to just exist and get love and in that knowledge of unconditional love they become more obedient they become more loving they become okay. all these great things but when you put conditional love on children they become they start to think authority doesn't love them mm -hmm. so they start to disrespect authority do you see that conditional more in girls versus boys? Like as a girl, you're supposed to be more obedient. You need to be pretty as yeah. well, but also get the good grades, do the work at home, sit at home, not yeah. want to be social, but then magically also be social somehow. Yeah, I think so. And I mean, I'm guilty of it as well. I remember when I was growing up, I treated my brother like he's a king. I, I would give him lots of unconditional Younger love. Younger or older? Younger. Yeah. Seriously, wow. He, I would literally, I remember watching football with him for 90 minutes and just being there in case he got hungry and to go get something from the fridge. Is that okay, wait, do you still <laughs> suffer from that? Because I have a friend who still yeah. does that. I'm like, what are you doing? I don't. He's, he's married now with kids okay. and it's changed. The dynamic's totally different now. But growing up, it was very much, are you hungry? Are you tired? Are you alive? Are you? And it was just the way we were conditioned. It was a, and then there's nothing wrong with it, but it was just not the same with the women. And so what happens when you give unconditional love to the boys in a Pakistani home, they grow up to happily love their parents, respect their parents and obey the rules. But when you don't do the same to the girls, they grow up a bit resentful and negative. Whereas if you give unconditional love to both kids, they end up being far more more uh, easy to then um, nurture and they become easier to parent. Unconditional love in childhood means they become a really easy teenager, but conditional love in childhood becomes a resentful teenager and a rebellious adult. So you're actually, it's counterproductive. Interesting. Yeah. And then, so then how does that translate into like that girl that grew up in that, I guess, environment? So for me, I don't have brothers oh. and I've, I feel like I have a certain resentment towards the Pakistani male because I'm like, I knew how you grew up. Yeah. And because I don't have a brother, I never had to do that. But I yeah. know if I did, maybe, maybe I would. And yeah. that's why I'm always like, oh, I'm not what you're looking for because... <laughs> I'm never going to do what you probably, what your mom did for you. And we see that a lot with our friends. But where, where does like, that come from in you? I And that's what I'm wondering, because I feel like, because I grew up in Pakistan, I saw my friends treat their brothers that way or mm -hmm. treat like older or younger. And I'm like, if he's younger, he should be respecting you or like, you mm -hmm. know, I don't know. But and, uh, where does it come from in you where you don't like that concept? Did you see your mom do it or something? Or I didn't see my mom do it, but I think I saw certain guy cousins get privileges that I wasn't allowed to do. Uh -huh. And I think like coming home at 12, why mm -hmm. can't I? And I get it. It's a safety thing, especially yeah. in Pakistan. But after a while, it's like you're living the life that I would love to live. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with yeah, I understand. I completely understand. Uh -huh. But I, I think the thing is, because as a girl in a Pakistani home, you also don't have to pay a bill. And mm -hmm. you don't have to ever, you don't have to work. If you work, you work, but you don't have to work. And you don't have to pay your own rent and you don't have to do all of these things. So I always felt like because the men, uh, especially my dad, was very on standby financially, um, I understood the kind of difference in trip because my brother wouldn't get that standby mm -hmm. treatment. I'm sure he can in bits, but yeah. he wouldn't ask for it. So I understood how domestically we would be more inclined to doing domestic du duties, but we get uh, ease when it comes to finances. But the only thing I resented was the difference in the love, not so much in the freedom. 
Okay. I found the freedom is fine. I can understand that. You know, the, the reality is uh, me 12 o'clock at night out, outside is different to my brother be 12 o'clock at night in terms of safety and stuff like that. Um, and I liked rules. But not that I liked rules, but I yeah. liked what is done to me as a person. I'm now self-regulated. Even in Dubai, I don't like to be out late. It's just I become self-regulated. But what I found difficult was a difference in love and not the freedom. And how come you chose, the, how come it's freedom that bothered? But you but, didn't grow up with difference in, right? With I didn't, but I think when it comes to, I think you hit it with the nail with that, where so much with the finances part, I think I kind of grew resentful where I'm like, but I do want to help you guys financially and don't look at me like I will never, I never will because Mm -hmm. I will grow up whatever. This is like 12 year old, (laughs) it'll help me talking. I will make it. I will help you guys. Um, Not that you need it, but that stability, I think, especially in Pakistan, like, oh, we have a son, he's going to take care of us in old age. Yeah. Our daughters, oh, we gotta, we have to worry about their weddings. We have to worry about X, Y, Z. Yeah. That, it, it's hard to just sit yeah. at home, do like cook, I don't know, dal yeah. and like have your hair looking good and be like, I'm like daddy's princess. Like, just Yeah, it is. But what I found, what I loved about him was whatever career I chose, it was a hobby that I turned into a career. I didn't have any pressure to support anybody. And what that enabled me to do is figure out what do I want to do in life? Whereas if I had the pressure of bringing money in, um, I would have to put that to the back burner and focus on what would be best for everybody. And so the fact that I was given that financial freedom is something I'm quite grateful for because I don't resent the careers I've chosen over the years. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it was purely to bring money in, I think I would live a very soulless kind of existence and I think I feel sorry for men that do have to do that. Or women. Or yeah. women that do have to do that. So I was grateful for that privilege. Uh, but I, uh, freedom-wise, I have zero. Yeah. I had No, zero. I think it's a really interesting take that you put on it. Yeah, that, like, I'm very you know, positive you just, about it. Yeah, but that, that kind of also plays with that whole, you know, follow your passion. I think it's like mm-hmm. what, like in your feminine energy, you're more calmer. You're yeah. more just like, you know, just following your passion mm-hmm. and just like living life. But then do you think that's kind of realistic? Because at some point... Like, do you want to help your parents or like, you know, buy your mom the designer bag she wants? Not that you have to be the one no, to do it. No, I think it, when I think about my parents getting old, I think about I want to be... I want to be looking after them, uh, you know, more emotional and physically looking after them. Okay. I want to be making their bed when they're sick. I want to be, uh, you know, taking care of them when they're not well. I want to be making the soup. I don't think about it in a financial sense. I think about it. How can I rub your feet when you're not well and stuff like that? That's what I'm looking forward to in the old age. I don't know. Maybe because I have a brother. So it's slightly different. Yeah. When you don't have a brother, you do have to think about the retirement plan. And so that's why I'm looking forward to the more nurturing side of when they get older not looking forward to it because god forbid it's something yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm no, so no, no. about yeah. but uh it's something i've embraced uh the financial side of things i don't enjoy spending my own money <laughs> i'm the same uh, other people's money all day all day all night yeah <laughs> I and i can tell you it. exactly how i can it's so like, bad go to dubai mall and spend everything uh, you, it's yeah. so bad i don't <laughs> like spending my money my money is like for like it's just numbers on a screen it's not to be used <laughs> so, to savings, i think yeah. that's what it is i see it as that but obviously i love spoiling my parents and stuff but it's not something i look forward to being like okay how would i remortgage the house i, I like that i don't have that pressure yeah all praise be to god that's yeah. that i that's really interesting yeah. i've never I've never had a conversation like that now that I think about it isn't it (laughs) yeah no and I think it's more because my friends I think we are all in hustle mode all the time yeah not that it's a good or a bad thing, but no, like, yeah. I think your hustle is really good because it gives you self-esteem and it gives you fulfillment. And you realize you've got more to offer the world um, when you're then just sat at home. And I found when I wasn't doing much, when I wasn't as productive, I wasn't a nice person. I spent too much time consuming the wrong content. I spent too much time thinking about negative things in my life. Whereas when I'm busy, I'm, I'm pr- I respect myself more. And when I respect myself more, I'm a nice, I have more respect to give to others. I am a nicer person to be around. So I do recommend recommend every woman, even if it's not for financial purposes, for your brain. Mm-hmm. I know women who are housewives, especially in our culture. I was going to ask Yeah, in our, the housewives for the last six years and they come to me for therapy and they'll mention what their mother-in-law did in 2014 and they'll talk about it like it happened yesterday. And I thought, I'm so busy. I don't even remember what happened last week. It's because they've got so much time on their hands. When you've got so much time on your hands and you're naturally not fulfilling your potential, you hold on to the negative. Whereas when you're busy and you're like uh, uh, fulfilled, what your mother-in-law did in 2016, yeah. do you like who cares? But those that that empty housewife 
is filled with negativity in honesty because yeah. it, you know, as much as i worship mothers and i think it's the best thing ever it's a uh, it's uh, not very rewarding because the children can't give the gratitude in the, in the beginning stages agree and they can't uh, communicate with you no. and they uh, they you you miss adult conversation and also you don't have the energy to look pretty anymore sometimes you don't recognize your body so all of those things makes you feel like you you are no longer the woman you respected yeah. and then you come back with anger and hostility towards your husband because he's the only one you can blame yeah yeah because he's getting on with life uh, he still looks great he's that still just, that know? sounds like the pattern of like every little every first girl. come to you drama is yeah it? But also that's every what girl. happens it happens and then they take it on the man and it's not his fault i mean he can't birth the child mm -hmm. but she doesn't know who else to take this resentment out on and it's like the fact that he can just go to work he has his body's exactly the same his uh, sex drive is exactly the same when every area of her life has changed so i always think when you get back to work what it does is it at least forces you to try and get the weight back to where it used to be mm -hmm. at least put makeup on in the mornings you start to fulfill your potential again so that's why I encourage it not because I think financially and I also think make child the priority first two three years they should be the priority but have something yeah have something if you can and so that pattern seems similar to like kind of what we grew up with because yeah. I think in our generation a lot of girls or a lot of mothers weren't working. I think no, the house my mom was didn't work. Did your mom? My mom didn't no, work either. So it was more common, I think, as opposed to now. Did your mom have lots of potential? Uh, yeah. Mine too. And I can see it. Yeah. And I know that she really tries to drive it through me and my other yeah, sisters. That's what my mom does. <laughs> yeah. And just, I guess that makes yeah, sense. Like the way your mom kind of drove you. Yeah, to, like, she's got so career. much potential. Same. She, she should just, never have been at home. Same. It's not for her. She's so social. She's got so many skills and stuff. like. It's not, she's not designed for it. So it, it led to resentment. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot about that with my grandmothers as well. I'm oh, like, really? there's so many different generations mm -hmm. to bring me to where I am for the freedoms I have. And That's I'm like, amazing. What, I'm like, but what am I supposed to be doing with this? Like, I'm always freaking out. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know what I'm supposed well, to be doing. Well, what do you want to do? I mean, what I'm doing, yeah, but I think I'm thinking more in terms of like even the marriage prospect, right? right. Before my generation, everyone was arranged was a thing. And mm -hmm. since you're from Kashmir, I'm assuming yes. it was the same. Yes. Yeah. So now in our generation, and all my friends wanted me to ask you this. Yeah. We're dating. Mm hmm what are we supposed to now be looking for? What are we supposed to be asking? Because I think there's so much weirdness now in the dating. Yeah. We didn't, we don't have our moms to kind of prepare us because they didn't date. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of them didn't. Of our friends are kind of like, I've only had one relationship in college. So like it worked out. Yeah. But like the ones that are like kind of navigating the yeah. pool. What are we supposed to be like? You know what? The demise of the arranged marriage is something that now, as I can look back, I actually think it was a really good thing. And I know really? it sounds bizarre. The reason I say this is because we as individuals overestimate our individuality mm -hmm. and underestimate background and family and culture. Okay. So when we're looking for a person, we're thinking we connect, we get on. But the reality is you get on. But what will keep you getting on is if you have shared values, cultures and beliefs. And when parents are selecting somebody, they're selecting that. They're selecting somebody who's got a similar background, similar kind of household, similar kind of family values, mm -hmm. and they put you together. And so what happens when they put you together is when you run out of love or when you run out, when you get annoyed with each other, you have the same belief systems. So what happens is you naturally, you find a common ground in some ways. Whereas when it takes, for example, I'm a British and then I mm -hmm. meet somebody who is, grew up in Germany and he's not from the same culture, nothing like that. Uh, of course, we can really get on on a surface level. But when push comes to shove, our values come into place. Our culture comes into place. What do you think is normal? What do you, when we have children, what do you think is normal? What do I think is normal? And when those things, this is why people from different cultures end up, unfortunately, more likely to part because the belief systems break down. Okay. And when you're finding a partner, we look for chemistry and connection when really shared culture is important. And when I say culture, I don't mean the same ethnic background, Sh same views on what school should we send the kids? What age can they be allowed to drive? What age? All of these things, how do, how do we split the finances? All of these mundane things become more important as you develop in your marriage. And when you're selecting by yourself, you're not thinking about these things. So that's why I'm now thinking I can understand mm -hmm. why arranged marriages were a thing. But do you think we look for chemistry and connection because that's kind of something that we never saw growing up? But you know what we did see growing up? Uh, commitment and duty. And chemistry and connection is temporary. But do you think, and I've had this conversation with a lot of people, a lot of marriages of that time were more situational and it's kind of like she couldn't leave. Like, you know, our moms were, all, they couldn't leave. But here's the thing. We assume that that uh, connection and chemistry is permanent. It's just not. 
It's just not. Majority of the time, it's not. But what is permanent and what decisions they did make is how do we keep this family together? And what happened in our parents' generation is they became committed to the marriage, not the person. The marriage has to work because the kids need both of us the, and the kids need access to, you know, both our financial situations and they don't need a step parent and a step mom mm -hmm. and a step. They need that cohesive environment. They need to know that grandma's here, granddad's there, blah, blah. Um, but what's happening now is if I don't like you now, I can leave you. But the kids are the ones that suffer. And I know they suffer when they see parents not madly yeah. in love. But one of the uh, the perks of when your parents do stay together is little things like your wedding day or your graduation or it's little things like you'll call mom and say has dad eaten today yeah yeah he's fine he's just you know he's just watching tv yeah whereas that worry you have between splitting your time and that impact uh divorce has on your ability to contain and maintain a relationship is something that is underrated nowadays yeah. and i think it has an impact and i think unfortunately the society at least in our pakistani culture people are looked down upon, especially in that generation, like, oh, your parents are divorced, why? Yeah. And I know that for in our family or even in my friends is always like, yeah, our moms just, it's a thing. Like yeah. how, how's the parental situation if you're considering someone, which I, I don't agree with, Yeah. Um, but it's a reality. And I know that was a huge factor. Yeah, I think what I disagreed with in Pakistani culture is they labored it as, as is what will people say. Exactly. But I would understand if someone said, well, what impact did it have on this person? Like say, for example, if your parents are divorced, and, and my brother wanted to marry you, I would ask, does she keep a connection with both parents? What impact did it have? Is she okay? As long as she's okay, it's all right. But when someone's been massively traumatized and hasn't healed from that trauma, their marriage is going to be difficult. The, it is going to trickle into their marriage. From that perspective, I can understand. But from a judgmental mm -hmm. perspective, oh, she's a single mom, that, that is just cultural yeah. and it's it, it's embarrassing and there's no positive consequences from that. But I, I do think when you do come from uh, some kind of trauma, it doesn't have to be broken home, it can be anything. Mm -hmm. I think a logical question to ask before engaging in a relationship is how did that trauma impact your view of love and relationships? Is that a heavy question to ask before Who getting cares? into a relationship? Who cares? What are you supposed to be asking before getting into it? Like, what are the things like finances, maybe like I don't, there's so many books written on it. Yeah. Islamic and uh, like even from some, yeah. I think there's like one 100 questions you should ask before marrying someone. Yeah. Okay. What from your perspective for a successful marriage or relationship, what mm. are some things we should be asking? What did you find most difficult about being raised and how has that impacted your view of love and relationships? And do you find people actually know the answer to that? No. And that's why they, you're asking, you know, I'm like, I don't even know what yeah, I would And then say. if they say something like my parents used to fight a lot about money, OK, then it might have created a wound in you. So when when money is tough, you might run away from the relationship. Or if you might say that they were physically abusive with each other, OK, that might mean that that's how you resolve conflict. If you've learned that, not your fault, but uh, something you do need to heal from. Or if they said they were really loving and kind to each other and they just made it work. Nice. Wow. Yeah, I think that's probably a really underrated question because we talk so much about what are your career goals, what are your aspirations, mm -hmm. and so many CEOs have the best first dates because they can tell you all the things that they're planning to do, but they don't tell you that overworking is a, a coping mechanism. They're actually working so much because they had abandonment issues at home and, you know, their mom and dad broke up and they had to support their mom from the age of 16 and now they don't have any emotional regulation. It could be, I mean, I, that's yeah. a bit deep, but, <laughs> but it could happen, you know, like, uh, yeah, obviously when you see a CEO and you think, wow, amazing, but you also should think, why are you addicted to work? What, yeah. what was the suffering that caused you? So, I mean, you? what do you do? So I, I'm on a date with the CEO. I can tell issues are there. Yeah. Do I just like walk away or am I like, okay, let's see, maybe well, like. Well, here's the thing. Everybody has issues. That's the thing. Everybody has issues, but you want to know how much of a handle they have over their traumas. If, if you meet somebody who is completely aware that they, they have these problems and they need somebody who adapts to that. Say, for example, a CEO recognizes that I'm not the most emotionally present person. Mm -hmm. And how I deal with that is I give my wife lots of gifts and presents, hoping she knows that that's my form of investment and hoping she understands that's my love language. That's my way of saying I love you. I might not say it verbally, but I need someone who understands my methods. If he speaks like that and he meets a girl that understands that, no worries whatsoever. But if it's a complete, somebody is like, I've got no issues. I'm great. I'm perfect. I'm this. There's no point. So love languages aren't BS. They're not BS, but what they do suggest is what you are deprived of as a child. 
if I need lots of verbal affirmation, what does that, where, where does that come from? Why? Why do you need so much verbal affirmation? If you need quality time, were you neglected by a parent? Did you not get, were you raised mm-hmm. by nannies? Or some, it tells you something about it. It's a, it's a, it tells, it reveals a lot. Okay. Yeah. So now I want to get into kind of back into the, the brown girl trope. Yes. I'm sorry. It's my I favorite trope. Yeah. It's, it's, it's because I who I am. It. I love being a brown girl. Yeah. So this is amazing. Same, yeah. honestly, and, the, and the other thing that, that I really, why I, this is important to me is sometimes online, they don't know I'm brown. They don't know where I'm from because my accent is so British. Really? So they end up thinking I'm br- from Britain or something. Uh, but I am fully brown. Yeah. yeah, no, yeah. No, no. And I, I love that again because there's not, there's just not that many brown girls doing yeah, it. Yeah. And I think o- the only thing I see online is like, this is how you be like, this is how you attract like a high value man or something. Mm, and it's okay. like, there's just, mm-hmm. there's so much more, I think, there's nuanced stuff that. that we need to know just yeah. as a brown girl. So yeah. we are kind of taught that, I, so I don't know how much home TV dramas you see. I don't, but my mom okay. is an expert. Okay. Yeah. I watch a lot. And okay. you know what? Home TV is like Pakistani <laughs> dramas, by the way, for those yeah. who don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. There is a, I'm sorry, you guys, I'm going to throw in Urdu, a chalak girl or clever girl trope. Sneaky. Sneaky. Yes. Is it wrong? And this has always bothered me because I had this debate with uh, people. Is being a sneaky <laughs> chalak girl wrong? I, I just feel like it's always in our culture, it's glorified to be that innocent girl that like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't know what's going on. And even the Chalak girl, she'll portray herself as being innocent to get the guy. Yeah. Is it wrong to, I don't know, like show your personality, do girls with personalities finish last? I don't know. Here's the thing. It, it depends how you view life. If you want a life where you can get the most out of it without giving too much, and that's you see life as a game and you want to collect, collect the most, then there's nothing wrong with being a sneaky girl. There's nothing wrong with pretending to be innocent, getting that man to fall in love with you, taking his money, doing your thing, you know, no judgment. But I promise you the route to mental health is being authentic. And when you have to sacrifice your authenticity in order to gain something, whatever you're gaining, you're losing touch with your own self. And it's never worth it to me personally. I mean, does being authentic, it's also kind of a form of vulnerability, right? You're showing someone your real self. Absolutely. A lot of people, firstly, can't even accept their own real self. They don't even know And if someone rejects you, because I have a friend, Mm -hmm. every time she's on a date with a guy, she's going to be more quieter, Mm -hmm. not show her personality. And she's like, and I swear they like it till then. But the minute, you know, after, there's only so much you can There's pretend. only so much you can lie, yeah. The minute she starts showing her real self, she's like, they pull, I can sense it. They're pulling back. Yeah. And then I'm like, but why don't you just show it from the beginning? So if they have to pull back, they'll pull back yeah. in the beginning. But her whole thing is like, but I know they won't like me. But then why do you want someone that won't like you? I think because she just wants someone because we're kind of, it's not, I think human beings, right? Yeah. Success to some degree does show I have someone that does like me unconditionally, or at least marriage kind of looks like that, right? Yeah. Like I managed to, I don't know, convince someone. To marry me? To marry me. Oh, I mean, it's sad, but it's like, that's sad. what, isn't that what love is blind is about or any of that where it's like, found my partner. I'm like, now I'm going to live my happily ever after. Well, um, there's a really famous psychologist, Dr. Gabo Mete, who says that human beings only have two needs in life. One is attachment, like either marriage or with your parents, whatever, attachment. And the other is authenticity. Now, if you have to sacrifice authenticity to get that attachment, it won't last. Any time you have to sacrifice the authenticity to get the attachment, it won't last. Or if you have to sacrifice, it's better to sacrifice the attachment and stay authentic. It's better to sacrifice the attachment. The reason being is because then you will attract who authentically likes you. You filter it down. So say, for example, I'm a really feisty, bad-tempered person and I hold it down for one one month, two months, three months. Eventually, all I'm going to do is attract somebody who's going to abandon me. Attract someone, abandonment. Attract, abandonment. Attract, abandonment. Until eventually I start assuming everybody's going to abandon me. Whereas if I show you who I am, only the people who can handle it will I attract to begin with. So the abandonment is less likely. So it's actually better to be authentic and attract an attachment that way. Interesting. An emotional unavailability buzzword. Yeah. What do we need to know about it? Um, well, the thing is, if you are emotionally unavailable, if somebody else that you're attaching to is emotionally unavailable, uh, what will happen is when we block out emotions, life will keep testing you until you almost hit a catastrophe and your emotions have to catch up with you. And so that's how we're designed. That's how life is. That's how God works. You know, the reality is we keep blocking, blocking, blocking. 
at some point or another, we that blockage will lead to us to a catastrophe until we have to be emotionally available. So it might be that I don't show my emotions, don't show my emotions, don't show my emotions. And then eventually my husband says, I can't deal with you like this. I'm going to leave you. And I'm left with three kids. But don't men love bitches? They do. <laughs> well, yeah, they really do. They and do. As women, don't we kind of like that standoffish cool guy? Do we really want we do in da- we do in dating, but not in love. Mm-hmm. And there's, that's the thing. The things that modern dating has taught us about how to con- find a partner is counterproductive on how to maintain a marriage. Of course, we want our cool guy, but it's all fun and games until you've gone into labor and he's too cool to pick up the phone. Or we all want that cool girl, but it's all fun and games until you lost your job and now you mm-hmm. are anxious to tell her because she might not show you any emotional yeah. support. So everything we're being taught in how to get a date is the exact opposite on how to maintain a marriage. And if we want to be serious, we have to pursue what leads to a long-term marriage rather than short-term satisfaction of temporary relationships. What's one belief since you've kind of entered into this field Mm -hmm. that you've had to unlearn that you strongly believed in? I think what I, well, that's a really good question. I'm usually really, (laughs) one thing that I've had to unlearn. Maybe you grew up learning about that, like. I think what I've had to unlearn is no type of, no bad behavior everybody has the potential for the worst behavior they could imagine okay so say for example you're one of those people that thinks i would never date uh, somebody 10 years older or 10 years Mm -hmm. younger everybody has the potential or say for example you say i never cheat on my partner everybody has the potential and i've really learned that because sometimes i'm dealing with clients and it's people who genuinely can't believe they're into this behavior or genuinely can't believe they're doing this genuinely can't believe they've gone into that avenue and it's because everybody has a potential for anything in the right or wrong conditions so when you've been emotionally deprived there's women that never thought they would cheat on their husbands but are doing that or there's men that never thought that they'd be watching certain type of porn but they're now doing that I think the thing that I've had to learn is your morals and what you your moral compass is dependent on your conditions and if you create good conditions you can stay that moral person but in the wrong conditions there's no bad behavior that's past anybody I feel the summary of that is like what my mom says to me you'll never know someone so just go for it so just dump the gun well you never know what people do yeah what scares you about getting married it's not the scary but like the whole I'll change as someone and then someone else will change. So why are we even talking? Like, so why are we even here? Well, more like let's just let's just go for it because it's not like we know what we're gonna do well, that, in ten years. You might as well jump the gun and then just hold on. But that's where shared values and beliefs are so important. Even if you risk it and just get with somebody, this is why arranged marriages used to work. Is because even if you risk it and just get with somebody, both of them probably came from households where they didn't believe in divorce. So it would just work. Or say if you would, whereas when you look at couples that cohabit and have kids before marriage, there's a higher chance of divorce. Why is that? Because they both had liberal values before marriage. So it's really about like the values that you bring to the table. It's not really so much about your complete connection. And so values come from what? Is it outdated traditional norms? It's whatever you consume. Yeah, if you consume your family's, uh, inherit, if you inherit their values, it's them. If it comes from social media, it's them. Um, I know from working with young children, they could be a child from Somalia, it could be a child from Pakistan, it could be a child from London. They have the same values because they consume the same content on TikTok. You can't tell where anyone's from anymore. That's true. Yeah. That's true. You, you'll meet a girl in Lahore, which will have the same values as a girl living in Hull in London, in England, sorry. Because they watch the same YouTuber. Scary. So then does that, the values, shared relationships, all of that, does that kind of also play into, I wanted to talk about like female friendships as well. Yeah. One of the things that we're kind of taught in our culture, at least, um, is your friends are there, but then also at the same time, you can't trust female yeah, friends. You know, Pakistani I mean? mums, my mom's not like this because I have really yeah. nice friends, but they really pit you against your friends, don't they? They really warn you against your friendships a lot. But I also see it a common thing. I mean, with me, my friends, like we're, we're a solid friends group yeah. for years and years and years. Mm-hmm. But I've seen it, especially coming out here. Maybe it's more of a thing in Pakistan. But it's also like when, I think when you're new in a city, right? Yeah. You never, girls compete against girls, yeah, which constantly. they do. Yeah. But, you know, is there, what's a toxic female friendship? Like, you know, if you're in a relationship, is the girl, like, I don't know, like hygiene. I would say like one thing that makes men and women toxic to be friends with is when they are boy crazy. 
or a bo- girl that's I want to talk a, about yeah. a boy that's girl crazy. The reason why that is really difficult to be friends with somebody like that is when somebody prioritizes the opposite sex and mm-hmm. prioritizes dating and prioritizes uh, the potential of having sex or whatever it is. When they when you meet somebody like that, it's a matter of time before you fall out. And the reason being is all it could take is somebody they had a crush on to like you or all it could take is you going out and somebody looking at you more or something like that because they value the opposite gender more than they value the connection they have with you. And so what happens is people who are boy crazy or girls uh, girls that are boy crazy or guys that are girl crazy, they will risk any friendship to get that boy or girl. So it even happens in business deals with boys when they're with each other, when they've got that one sleazy guy friend yeah. who will sleep with your wife just because you, you know, just, and then with girls, all it takes is for her to be, see a guy that she likes. And if he looks at you automatically, she's in jealous mode now or whatever it is. So I think boy crazy women are very difficult to be friends with. My recommend, my personal experience, I have the best friendships with women who are happily married because that boy craziness goes. Yeah. Does it go? Because I know women who are married who are like, oh, as in that it's not an element in our connection. Because if okay. she's happily married, it's not like that. But happily, uh, boy crazy girls aren't usually happily married. They usually, they're usually never, they're not. never. Yeah. But they're also like kind of, um, she talked to my husband in this way. Like I, I've seen people and I, at least in our, not even only in our culture, yeah. I've seen it like I think everywhere where it's everywhere. like- I don't even know what I'm supposed to do. Well, it's an evolutionary thing. thing. Women would compete for men. And uh, that's how we would survive. We can't go and hunt and gather ourselves. We'd rely on a man. And the strongest best man we would take from another woman if we had to. So it's evolved in us to be (laughs) jealous of each other. This is why I think feminism is a bit of nonsense. It's like girls supporting girls. All these feminists I've seen that say that, all it takes is for one guy that they both like for them to throw girl code out the window. I don't know. 100%. All it takes is one guy that they both like. They both like the same guy or one guy that she likes and he likes her. It just takes one guy that they both like to throw a girl code out the window. I've seen feminists, as soon as they like a guy, they don't care if he's got a girlfriend. What's a feminist for you? Uh, I think a feminist is somebody who, that's a good question. I think genuinely, I know they on, on paper they say it's equality and wanting equality. But I also think it's a woman who almost resents anything that is uh, con- socially conditioned as feminine. If they think that it's socially, it's come from social constructs, anything that's feminine, but it's come from social constructs in their views, they resent it. So it's not just about equality. It's also like, why do you think I should do the cooking? It's a resentment towards what are traditionally feminine qualities. Do you think it's also because you just kind of don't want to do it? So for me, for cooking, for example, I do call myself a feminist. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes more from because I didn't have a brother. Yeah. And also because I grew up in Pakistan, right? So we did have a lot of domestic help. I didn't have to do cooking. Mm-hmm. Now I moved to America, which I also want to ask you about mm-hmm. how you feel about the societies. America, I would say at the time, especially in Brown Town, yeah. is traditionally gender roles are assigned. Yeah. So they're kind of like, wait, you're like 19 years old. You've lived your whole life. Like you don't know how to like cook or you don't know. Like you're 19. Wh- no, not yeah, when okay, I was moving gender. there. No, 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 I'm not 19. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, when I moved there for college, yeah. they're like, you like, you know, what did you do? Like, what, did your mom not teach you anything? X, Y, Z, all of that. And my yeah. mom was like, you focus on your study. Do whatever you want. Yeah. If you want to cook, cook. If you don't, yeah. you don't need to. Mm-hmm. But I feel like their gender roles are more pronounced. And for me, that's when it kind of became like, are you going to sit there and now judge me because I can't make jive? Are you gonna In America, s- really? I thought they would be In so- Brown Town, 100%. Yeah. And I, I've seen that with UK, at least. At least yeah. the UK I've been exposed to here. I think the girls grew up in a certain type of way, yeah. which is kind of like what you were saying, like, the boys are something else, the girls are something yeah, else, definitely. and we've learned these things. Here's the thing. It's not about cooking or cleaning or anything like that. It's more about if your husband likes a certain trait, are you willing to accommodate that? And what's happening... If you like the person if you If you like the... If it's your husband or something like that. Now, what's happening is women are like... I'm not cooking for you. I'm not cleaning for you. You you can speak. But that's how men like to be loved. It's similarly like if a man was saying to a woman, I'm not paying the bills. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to look after you financially. It'd be like, but that's how women like to be loved. And I think it's not so much about cooking, cleaning. Say if he doesn't want that. It's a more rejection on expectations that a man has towards you. But life involves some level of expectation. Otherwise, you're not going to have a marriage. If your husband comes to you and says, I I don't care about cooking and cleaning, but I really like if someone would iron for me, a feminist might be like, do it yourself. But a wife would say... Do you think she really would? Because I feel like a feminist... I I don't know. I I think a feminist would say, do it yourself. 
why you put two hands and get married if, yeah, if that's the attitude, attitude right? if you've got two hands you should say something like that but the a wife would say okay babe and then I'll, um, no worries i'll do that that's not a problem and if, and if she said and if she says to him can you change the oil in my car all right babe is if that means something to you i'm happy to accommodate it what happens with feminism is even if that somebody's need if it's something that they feel is imposed on them they reject it even if it's their partner's need and that's why i don't like it but do you think then because i think gender roles especially in more modern societies where you can't have domestic help or the woman phys- she actually can't sit at yeah. home monetarily like yeah both people which have is, to work yeah understandable in that case, in that case, then he the can't woman probably expect. will be like two hands. Yeah, in that case, he can't expect it. He genuinely can't expect. She's got two hands, and but it's not a case of I'm not doing it because I hate you. It's I'm not doing it because I can't. And there's a different understanding to that. Whereas if it's like I'm no, that's not my job. That's negative. Mm-hmm. Why, why, why be negative? But if it's like, babe, I really can't. I'm so tired. That's a positive way to look at the same problem, and that leads to closeness. Whereas the other one, right, where you got two hands, it's too negative. And that's what I don't like about feminism. Even if the woman can do it, she chooses not to because she feels like there's a societal pressure on her and she wants to reject that. I was going to say because she's a bad bitch. How do you feel about the bad bitch movement? Like just embracing yourself and just being like, this is... What what, what is a bad bitch movement? I think it means more like just being comfortable in your own skin, Mm -hmm. whether... And I think modern feminism, men's definition of it, at least a couple of my guy friends, Mm -hmm. we're going to see like you're like just bodily hair and is that what it means like Ew. you know like she you know what she's a bad bitch she's she a wants, bad bitch she wants to I'm show so herself fa- i'm so <laughs> against that stuff because it's just not who i am but I, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean it's not right um but if she wants to just embrace who she is i i think embrace whoever you are but don't expect unconditional love that's what i think if, if you want to grow your armpit hair and if you want to dye your hair blue and if you never want to cook and clean absolutely but don't expect acceptance except that some people don't like that just don't expect unconditional love. Here's what the problem is happening. Feminists are doing whatever they want, but they have the same expectation that a man should be attracted to that. He's not going to be. Simple. Grow your hair. Some men. Mm, straight men. Mm. We call them straight <laughs> men here. right? A straight man is not going to be attracted to masculinity. He's not. So if you grow your uh, hair, if you dye your hair or sh- cut it short, get piercings everywhere, this like, absolutely do whatever you want. But in that process, accept you're not going to get unconditional love. That's not how it works. Similarly, so that's more exterior masculinity. But but even uh, sorry to you're interrupt you. It. But similarly, a man that wants to play video games all day, watch porn all day, not what not watch his weight. Do it. Absolutely. You're not a bad bitch, but do it. But don't expect unconditional love. It's not going to happen. Be realistic. That's all. Watch porn all day. Play your video games. Get yourself one of those VRs and do all that nonsense. But don't be mad at girls that aren't attracted to you. Why would they be attracted to you? Similarly, feminist, wear what you want, grow your hair out, dye your hair blue. Men are not going to be attracted to you, but don't be mad at them for that. That's a bad bitch. That's a bad bitch. (laughs) I don't care about who cares about who's attracted to you. That's a real bad bitch. I don't want attraction and acceptance. But one who's saying, why should I want men to actually like, I have these views and a man should love me regardless. No, it doesn't work like that. Just like if if it takes one man, (laughs) it takes one man who's going to be few and far between and you're going to face a lot of rejection in the process. But as long as you want to keep that, absolutely. But just don't be mad at the men that don't accept it. You moved here when? 2019. How have you found um, <laughs> Dubai society culture? If you want to take your sip, take your sip. No, it's okay. <laughs> Compare it to the UK because everyone has like a whole spiel. I hate with UK it. with a okay. passion. Everything about it. Did you it. always hate it before moving here? Absolutely. Okay. It's just one of the worst cities I've ever heard of and seen in my life. Are you from UK or London? London. Okay. Yeah. I actually love London. Everybody loves London. Yeah. Everybody that visits loves London. And Nights I know why. It's my like, spot. <laughs> yeah. Everybody that visits loves it. And I'll tell you why. The people that visit, you have to have money to visit London. You can't just visit London. Yeah, that's true. And so when you visit London, you live in Knightsbridge, you go for a coffee in Harrods, and then you come home. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, what's that? What's that? It was amazing. It's the best city in the world if that's what you're going to do. Yeah. But when you live, Live there. It's a survival of the fittest. It's cold. It's miserable. But more so than anything, the culture of the people. I love that I'm from London because we've got a rawness about us and we don't take ourselves seriously. But we don't have any hospitality. 
it's just not our culture in London. It's not the culture to be like, my home is your home. Yeah. My fridge is your fridge. My coffee is your coffee. I remember working in England. And even when you work in, in English people in this country, they'll put their name on their milk when they bring it into the office. They'll say, you owe me 63p. Have you got it? You know, and they'll go to the shops and you know how it's natural for yeah. us. I could never go to the shops and come empty handed when somebody's yeah. they will go to the shops, just get themselves something and come back. And they're like, do you want a chewing gum? I'm like, bitch, where's, where's my drink? Yeah. You know, I'm not used to it. And I never got used to it. I never got used to being in the staff room and somebody is saying, who uh, who, uh, who ate my lemon? And it's like, do you care There's about a lemon? The world. There's bigger things to worry about. And it's that entitlement. It's that competitiveness. It's that lack of sharing that I just can't get used to. And it trickles down into everything they do. And and, okay. and and so I just can't be around it. Whereas Arab hospitality is wonderful. You know what Arab hospitality I, yeah. is about. How can I help? Even with us, like, you know, how can I help? Okay, ma'am, uh, how can I how can I help you is the mentality here. How can I feed you? How can I make your life easier? In London, it's that will be 30p. That will be 84p. I'm not, my petrol costs this much. I'm not dropping it. You know, it's that mentality. I'm just not used to it. And I can never get used to it. So do you have clients here as well? Yeah. Yeah, here and London. What yeah. have you seen the differences? And are your clients primarily women? Uh, no, the primary men. Seriously, okay. For some reason, I was like, because the housewife analogy, I guess. Yeah. So I was like, maybe it's just a bunch of women. No, I have a majority men. And, and, you, and so, what are they asking you without the confidentiality? Here's what it is in Dubai. Here's the problem in Dubai: the women have nannies, cooks, chefs, drivers. Is that a problem? Here's the problem: they do nothing for the man. He sits there thinking, I've made your life so easy. You've got a cook, you've got a nanny, you've got a driver. You don't have to do anything. And yet you can't even make me a cup of coffee when I ask for it. And you can't, or you can't even get me a sandwich. I'm not saying, and, and it's not oppressive if I'm making your life so easy and happy in so many other ways. But the moment I want my life made to be easy and happy, you're like, oh, sorry, let's get the maid to do it. And they lose affection for each other. Wait, so these men are confiding in you yeah. about these things. Yeah. So then what's your, like, are you doing like, are you telling them like communication techniques? I do. Like I say to them a communication, but also selection is something. The woman that wants all of that help is not the woman that it likes to nurture. She's just not. There's nothing wrong with it. I, I would definitely have a maid if I could and stuff like that or mm -hmm. a nanny. I, I'm definitely would be. I'm not against it. But the reality is a woman that wants all that extra help and doesn't want to drop the kids to school and doesn't want to, you know, make a sandwich. She was not nurturing before marriage. She won't be nurturing after marriage. She chose you because you created that lifestyle for you. So your selection process was a problem. There were probably signals that she wasn't very nurturing before marriage and you chose badly. And, and maybe nurturing just isn't her. It's not her thing. She it's not, it's her not thing. for everybody. Yeah. It's not for everybody. But you chose a woman that wasn't nurturing. You then it gave her a lifestyle that prevents nurturing. And now you're mad that she's not nurturing. Yeah. So your your selection process needs to be evaluated. Damn. But also your communication style. And then, so what are you seeing in the UK clients? How are the how are the girls? Oh, it's out just there? A, a lot of women cheating on their husbands. That's the main thing. Question: Is are the, is this brown town cheating? Yeah. Or is a lot of Pakistani girls cheating on their husbands. Everyone was always cheating, and now we just know about it. No, I don't think so. Like, do you think, think in our parents' generation, everyone was cheating? It's kind of like there's so many other movements. Maybe where... I'm from Kashmir. We're a bit different. Okay. Um, we're we're just like we don't know what cheating is. Okay. It's very like a rural <laughs> environment. You guys are in the but, mountains. Yeah, just doing thing. I just think it's very common amongst the women now more than ever before. Why? I think here, here's what it is in the typical Pakistani boy in London. He goes to work, comes back. As long as you're nice to his mom and food is ready and he has shisha on the weekends, he's pretty happy. He, d he doesn't have that kind of pleasure-seeking uh, mm -hmm. side to him Driver, as much. Yeah. They don't, they're just not d built like that. And they have very simple requests and they live as very simple. They have simple mentality. Be nice okay. to my mom, have food, let's go for shisha. And maybe they'll play a few video games here and there. They're, they're simple people. Uh, what's happening is the women are becoming more and more feminist and they're thinking, I don't want to be nice to your mom and I don't want to cook you food and I don't want to do that. And so what's happening is they are, uh, they're seeking relationships outside of the marriage. But do you think think but what are they getting from these relationships outside of the marriage because uh, they still have to come home and be nice to his mom or like you know uh, deal with the mom what it is is the validation of they can get a guy from a different culture that means a lot to pakistani women pakistani women usually grew up especially when they're younger in the uk with some level of racism you know the white guy wouldn't they be did, interested yeah. in you or whatever it is and so now that we're, social media has made every kind of ethnicity desirable when they get 
a guy, for, or, or an English guy interested, or if they get a black guy interested, or if they get a Hispanic guy interested, even if he's not offering anything to her, she's overexcited by it. There is a saying, and I think it's a, and you can tell me right. Yeah. Cheating comes generationally. I don't want to say genetic, but if your parents cheated, you cheat. Yeah, it's I trait. posted about that today and I got a lot of, oh, I got a lot of uh, backlash. Is it true? It. Absolutely. Boys and girls both. Boys and girls both. Here's what it does. Cheating, firstly, it gets normalized. And so you see it as a natural consequence of being with someone for too long. Emotional or physical? Both. Yeah, both forms of cheating. Emotional? I feel like there's a gray line. You could leave, even say me saying hi to a guy with two eyes and exclamation Here's point. the thing. Here's what cheating is. There's secrecy involved and some sexual energy. If there's no secrecy, even if there's sexual energy, it's not cheating. There's some people that have threesomes and stuff. Yeah, there's no secrecy involved. But if there's secrecy and sexual energy, it's it's cheating. Interesting. Yeah. So if we define it based on that, then we know what uh, what cheating is. And then um, I, I think that it's becoming very, very common amongst our community. Uh, and so girls. is there... If some and and the decline in religion as well. Can you move on from cheating in a relationship? Uh, yes, you can. Or would you advise cut the ties? I would. I would advise men and women differently. Okay. Uh, what I find men who forgive cheating because it's so emasculating for them. They find it so emasculating. They start to resent themselves. They start to be angry. Not at the spouse, at themselves. They're themselves because they don't have the strength to leave. Interesting. Usually what happens is they get so angry at themselves, they start thinking that they are less of a man. They start thinking if their friends knew, what would they think? And what happens is they have all this anger and resentment and it comes out in the form of abuse towards a woman or towards themselves. Verbal and physical? Verbal and physical. So it will turn into controlling behavior. It will turn into insults. It will turn into, you know, uh, like could be physical. It, it's, it's men don't know how to process emotions so they process it physically okay. and so through anger anger is really the deep root of anger is probably some form of depression so it, it does something to them that's okay. not good for them for women we have so much social social support when we've been cheated on we can talk to a friend who's been through the same thing we can talk to our mom we can do it's not we don't feel less of a woman in a sense we just think he's a bit of an idiot whereas a man starts to think I'm not a man if I if she's done this don't so, you think you'd feel less of a woman because like I there's something he stopped finding me attractive. He, yeah. Something happened and now he just... Yeah, I'm sure. You know, to be honest, I haven't been in that position. So I'm very neither. limited so, in my understanding of it. it life, I'm, sure. I'm still very limited. But I do think that for women in general, from my experience of them, what happens is they start to withdraw their love from their husband when they've been cheated on. For a man, he starts to impose abuse when he's been cheated on. And that's kind of the difference. Well, with women, they don't necessarily turn to being, not all of them, but if they become physically aggressive, they usually were aggressive before the cheating. But what happens is you don't take a meek, kind woman that been cheated on and she starts beating up her husband that yeah. doesn't happen but she will withdraw her love she'll be less likely to be there for you and your family and cook and clean and love you uh, but she might stay she might stay but she'll withdraw her love with men they impose they give anger hostility verbal abuse so on and so forth so that's why it's more negative where uh, in terms of a, a household when a man's been cheated gotcha. on so long story short it's situational I guess situational. if you're gonna stay or but not I do think if uh, it's I, I do think if you have children, you should try. You should definitely try. You just have to bury this existing relationship and start a new one with new set of guidelines and a new set of like, because behind cheating is always a message. No, People think cheaters are just narcissists. They love that statement. But the reality is a cheater had a need and they probably communicate, communicated a message for some time to their partner. They're probably saying for some time, I really want you to start making more of an effort or I would really appreciate it if you, you know, supported me with this. They always say something and it's been on deaf ears until eventually they step out. They stop asking it from their partner and they start seeking it somewhere else. So you have to ask your partner, what was the message and meaning behind this affair? And if we can embed this in the marriage and not seek it elsewhere, we stand a chance. But if we can't, then there's no point. And do you think some people just, it's its the chase? The, uh, of a new person? Of a new person. I think so. Some people are just naturally pleasure seeking. But even those people who love a chase, something triggers them. They might be feeling low in some area of their life. They might be feeling bored. They might be feeling unfulfilled. They might be feeling undesirable. But when their life is fulfilling, you're less likely to choose cheating because it's usually a coping mechanism. And what can you do if you feel unfulfilled? Uh, I think figure out what your potential is. If you're feeling unfulfilled, it usually su suggests that you are losing respect for yourself. 
your day-to-day routine is not somebody or something you respect. You're either waking up late, you're not taking care of your body, mm-hmm. you're not making uh, the money you'd like to make, you're not connecting with people the way you'd like to. And as a result, you're losing self-respect and, uh, and that leads to a lack of fulfillment. So find a way to create a set of skills that not only help you, but help others and you'll start to feel more fulfilled. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So we're at time, unfortunately. I had so many more questions. Oh, did you? I did. Yeah. But <laughs> we'll voice note them to me. Yeah, I will. I yeah, will. Well, thank you so much for no, coming. No, don't be silly. My time. pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. No worries.